Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's broadcast. Good evening, His Worshipful Mayor, the Leader of the Council, Councillors, Member of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, and our residents and all that are watching tonight's broadcast on our online event this year. I hope you are all well and please continue to follow the government's guidelines to reduce coronavirus infection, especially the Omicron variant. My name is Councillor Neka Kizo and I'm the cabinet member for community safety and cohesion in London Borough of Enfield. It's a great honor and it's a privilege for me to say a few words tonight about Holocaust Memorial theme, One Day. One day. Today we shall be invited to reflect upon each day as our one day. One day at a time for those suffering persecution and genocide. The utterly unprecedented times through which we are living currently are showing us that life is one day, one day at a time in the midst of the pandemic. One day for Holocaust Memorial Day, 27 January, that we put aside to come together to remember and to learn about the Holocaust, the Nazi persecution, and the genocide that followed in Cambodia, that followed in Rwanda, that followed in Bosnia and in Darfur, in the hope that there may be one day in the future with no genocide. We learn more about the past. We empathize with others today and we take action for a better future. Today, we want to commemorate what happened in Warsaw on 19th of April, 1943. One day, one day that the Jewish inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto fought back against the Nazi regime. One day, one day on 12th of July, 1995 in Bosnia, when Many women saw their husbands, their children, their fathers, sons and brothers for the last time. One day, 17th of April, 1975, when Khmer Rouge entered the Cambodian capital and the terror that followed five years after, with two million people murdered. Today, one day, one day when life changed, survivors of the Holocaust and the genocide often talk about their one day when everything changed, sometimes for the worse and sometimes for the better. I, Big Neil, feels that from one day to the next, everything changed and yet, nothing had changed. One day, Gretty, her school friend, greeted her with an embrace. And the next day, she ran across the road and turned her head so as not to acknowledge her. One day at a time. It may be hard to pick out just one day. As for many, to keep going through each and every day was a huge struggle with no end in sight, no glimmer of hope, and the next day would be any better. One day in the future, those that were targeted and persecuted held out for that one day in the future when there will be no more suffering when there will be a day of liberation. And today, today, this one day, 
we will all come together in our communities in Enfield to learn from the Holocaust and genocide and to say we have a better future for our residents in Enfield. Today we say, please enjoy our broadcast. Today is our one day. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be able to speak to you this evening and that despite the challenges of COVID, we can present a worthy event to all of our Enfield residents online again this year to commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day 2022. It's crucial that we continue to observe Holocaust Memorial Day to acknowledge the terrible deeds of the past and for us to reflect and consider how much we've learned and how we can continue to learn. And importantly, to think and take actions to ensure that we do all that we can to prevent these terrible events happening again. This year's theme of one day is very apt as it captures how quickly life can change for people. It's a powerful snapshot in time. It cannot give the full picture, the context, the background that's needed, but it can help to bring a piece of the full picture to life. For many people in our world, the challenges that can happen in the matter of a few hours or in one day can be profound and they have devastating consequences. Families torn apart, whole communities destroyed. In the 24 hour world of news, we can see terrible events unfold in real time, oppression and violence inflicted on people motivated by ideological hatred. The fact that those communities may not be our immediate neighbours doesn't mean that we should shy away from trying to do what we can to help those who need a voice and those who need assistance. The genocide that created the context for Holocaust Memorial Day shows us in terrible detail just how quickly inhumanity can escalate into the worst kinds of action being taken by those with power against those without. The life changing events that face people we commemorate on Holocaust Memorial Day in 2022 continue to be felt by those around the world, people who are experiencing and living with the consequences of genocide. The other side of one day is to provide a sense of hope that things can one day in the future be better partly achieved by humans working together for the good. One day gives us new opportunity to consider that no matter how dark the day may be, there is always the possibility to bring light to it. We can do something to help others, to challenge prejudice, discrimination and hatred. Let's make that one day every day and let's move towards a more tolerant, kinder and safer world in doing so. One day can change your whole life. I want to relate to you the actual words of someone whose whole life changed in one day, torn away from the tiny village of Radin in Poland during the time of the Holocaust. This is her testimony. In my heart, I was still convinced that the only refuge for us was to join the partisans in the forest. I've got to go, I told Papa, who I knew deep down shared my feelings. Okay, Ivana, he said, we'll leave Radin. If there's no other way, we'll go to the forest. We went to tell Mother. I believe she'd always known that one day it would come to this, but we were not prepared for her answer. No, she said, you will have to go on without me. Grandmother would never make the journey. I must stay to look after her. She refused to change her mind. She remained adamant. You go and save yourself, she said. This is my decision. You are not responsible. You must go and live. But please understand, Grandmother has no one but me. My obligation is to stay with her. We argued but we could not sway her. She wanted to come, but nothing would deter her because of the obligation she felt. Our parting will remain forever on my mind. We hugged and kissed goodbye again and again, and at the door I turned to look back 
to take one last mental picture of my dear mother. I can still see her, her dark, wavy hair, prematurely grey, her beautiful, strong features unchanged. I was torn between my fear of dying and my conviction that I was betraying her, letting her down when she needed me. A hundred times I told myself to stay. A hundred times my terror forced me to leave my adored mother, the one to whom I had turned in my troubles ever since I was a tiny child and who with a single kiss made me whole again. To this day I still wonder if I had insisted more or begged just a little longer, maybe she would have relented. My only comfort is in the knowledge that in the last moment before she and my grandmother were led to the gas chamber, she would find consolation that her husband and children were still alive. Alive to carry on the tradition and commitment for which she gave her life. And so it was in millions of Jewish households, not only those who said goodbye to their families, men and women who had been part of German life and society for more than a thousand years had all their possessions taken from them. On one day, they were dragged from their homes without friends, without hope, and packed into cattle trucks to take them to Auschwitz or Birkenau where they were treated worse than animals, and there they perished. On one day, their German friends turned into enemies. On one day, the entire male population of the Czech village of Lidice were murdered. Beginning on the night of Kristallnacht, November the 9th, 1938, more than 1,000 synagogues were burned or otherwise damaged. Rioters ransacked and looted 7,500 Jewish businesses, killed 91 Jews and vandalized Jewish hospitals, homes, schools and cemeteries. Just as the glass of these imposing buildings were shattered, so were the lives of the Jewish people all over Germany also shattered. How could the Nazis sink so low? to reach the nadir of corruption and annihilate a people who had done no harm and who had contributed so much to the prosperity of their country. And so many died in a single day. One day can bring death and destruction, but one day can also bring hope and salvation. Those who were targeted and persecuted held out for one day in the future when all their suffering would be over. I want to tell you about the one day that Simon Wiesenthal, the famous Holocaust survivor, spoke about when he was liberated from Muthausen concentration camp. It was 10 o'clock in the morning with a bright sun shining down to help celebrate the moment of liberation. The American tanks entered the camp and every prisoner struggled to get to them. I was about 150 yards from the first tank. I covered the first 100 yards, but then I collapsed on the ground. I was lying on the ground, trying to get up again, fascinated by the American flag fluttering on the tank. I could not take my eyes from the stars on the flags. Every star had a meaning of its own. One was a star of hope, one was a star of justice, one of tolerance, one of friendship, one of brotherly love, one of understanding and so on, a symbol of all the things we had lost in the Holocaust. The Holocaust survivors who went on to recreate their lives have taught us that every single day in our life counts. They have taught us to cherish freedom every day to understand what a gift it is to be able to walk in the open, to see a flower, to open a window, to breathe fresh air, love others, never hate, practice tolerance, stand up for others if they are being picked on, bullied or ostracised. Live every day as if it might be your last. As King David said 
in the book of Psalms. Teach us to number our days that we may get us a heart of wisdom. Let this be our watchword each and every day of our lives. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's important not just that I remember, the UK remembers, but the world remembers the Holocaust. During that time, we saw the worst of humanity, and it's therefore important that as more Holocaust survivors pass, that we pick up the baton and remember what happened um, through persecution, the concentration camps, so we can be a better society than they were then. Uh, and like I said, as uh, more survivors um, pass away, it is really important that we continue to remember what happened. The Frank family went into hiding. They're originally from Germany and moved to the Netherlands, but clearly um, after war broke out and Germany invaded uh, the Netherlands, they went into hiding because um, Anne's sister was giving a deportation order. So luckily there were people who wanted to help the Frank family and they went into hiding in a secret annex above a warehouse where Anne's father had worked. Now they had to live in secret, quietly for most of the day because they couldn't afford for people to hear below them that they existed in this annex. In the morning at 6.45am, the alarm of Mr and Mrs Van Peel's went off. Herman Van Peel got up, put the kettle on and went to the bathroom. After 15 minutes, the bathroom was free again and it was Fritz's turn. Anne got up and removed the blackout screens from the windows. The people in hiding took turns to use the bathroom. At 8.30am, a risky half an hour started. The men in the warehouse started their working day while the office helpers had not yet arrived. Any noise from the people in hiding was dangerous as the warehouse below hid the hiding place and the warehouse staff were unaware of the people in hiding. If you listen to her, Anne's diaries show a phenomenal amount of monotony because the days all consisted of the same. She carried on writing the diary, studying, they listened to the BBC and if you listen to the diaries either online or if you uh, read them you'll see how much listening to the BBC World Service gave them hope during a terrible time. At 9am the helpers started working in the office above the warehouse. The people in hiding walked around in socks and still had to be quiet but sounds from above now ceased less suspicious. The rest of the morning was devoted to reading, studying and preparing for their lunch break. At 12.30pm the warehouse workers went home for lunch and the helpers and people in hiding had the place to themselves for a while. At 12.45pm a few of the helpers, usually Johans, Victor's and Bep came up to the secret annex to have lunch and others frequently joined them, although others went elsewhere. Miep usually stayed in the office to keep an eye on things. For the people in hiding, it was nice to see other people and to hear the latest news from the city. At 1pm, the radio was switched on for the BBC News. At 1.15pm, they had lunch and at 1.45, the helpers went back to work at the office. This monotony came to an end when obviously someone um, reported their family being in hiding and unfortunately they, she did go to um, a concentration camp and in the end she died in Bergen-Belsen just before the end of the war. But during those days, in hiding, they had to live so quietly because they, they were so afraid to be heard downstairs. And I think if anyone wants to read more, do go on the Anne Frank website and read the diaries because they're, it's really important to remember and her story especially. One day I very much hope not to go onto social media and someone challenging um, the Holocaust Education Trust or Auschwitz Memorial or something like that. That is one day I really would like to see. Um, but one day we can be better and we can move on and one day we won't have um, discrimination, persecution of people in this world 
um, for their faith, their sexual orientation or whatever, that we all live side by side with respect, equality and humanity. Hello and welcome to our synagogue, Southgate Progressive Synagogue. We have four Torah scrolls in our ark. Although all four of them contain exactly the same words and have very similar layout, they do have their own characteristics. The difference is size, clarity, writing style, thickness of the vellum uh, that they're made of, and their weight. One of the most important and indeed enjoyable roles of the rabbi is reading the scrolls on Shabbat morning, on the Saturday. This weekly engagement means that I very quickly develop a relationship with the scrolls, and I do tend to have my favorite. My first preference is the smallest of the scrolls in the ark. It is not everyone's favorite, as the Hebrew writing is quite small. In some places, the text is readable, as the letters are jet black. In other places, the text has somewhat faded into a brownish color. Since it is my favorite, and since I am the one who reads from the scroll most Shabbatot and festivals, the small scroll is the one that merits seeing daylight more than any other scrolls. It is particularly appreciated by scroll, scroll carriers and those who need to elevate it. With that scroll, these are tasks that even a child could easily perform. It is therefore no surprise that parents of our B'nai Mitzvah students, when they celebrate their Bar Mitzvah, use it to bless their children, and it is extensively used by for children's services, family services, and youth. Yet there is another very special thing about this scroll, indicated by a small plaque at the, wall, at the bottom of the Etz Chaim, the wooden handle. This plaque reads, number 365, Czech Memorial Scrolls, Westminster Synagogue, London, 1964, 5724. Another framed plaque gives information about the dedication of this scroll. In commemoration of the dedication of the Czech scroll Sefer Torah number 365 to the lost community of Karlsbad, Southgate Progressive Synagogue, 29th Kislev, 5770. Karlsbad is a town in Western Bohemia, the Czech Republic, about 80 miles of west of Prague. Karlsbad is its German name, while the locals know it as Karlovy Vary. The town was ruled by Charles IV, the King of Bohemia, who founded the city in the 14th century. The town is famous for its hot springs and many visitors. Not much is known about the Jewish settlement uh, in the town in medieval times. Jews started arriving in the town in the 16th century as visitors to the spas, and by the 19th century, the Jewish community was well established. In 1938, the Sudetenland, including Bohemia and Moravia, were annexed to Nazi Germany. The local synagogue, built in 1877, was torched in 1938 and torn down in 1939. Nearly all of the town's Jewish residents fled the region, and the remaining Jews were interned. Over 90% of the Jewish residents of the town were murdered in Nazi death camps. What is the connection between Karlo Vivari and the scroll? After the annexation of the Sudetenland in, uh, to Nazi Germany, members of the Jewish community in Bohemia and Moravia acted to bring a variety of artifacts to what was later become the Central Jewish Museum in Prague. The group worked hard to preserve what was saved from the hands of the Nazis and local vandals. Among the artifacts were the Torah scrolls gathered in, uh, from synagogues in the regions. The hope was for these treasures to be protected so that one day they might be returned to their original homes. 
Only two survivors remain of the museum curators who were eventually murdered at Theresien and in Auschwitz death camps. The museum curators tagged the Torah scrolls. It was therefore possible to trace most of the scrolls back to their original synagogues. However, some of the scrolls lost their label somewhere and therefore it is unknown where they come from. These were known as the orphans. Our scroll is one of these orphans and we cannot trace it back to the original community or perhaps family who had it. Stuart Werner, a member of our congregation, was born in Kalovivari. In November 2009, the community dedicated uh, this scroll to the memory of members of the Jewish community of the town who perished in the Holocaust. It is my hope that we will continue to use the scroll for many years to come. We will continue to cherish it even after it can no longer be used as a scroll for Torah services. It will reside in our ark as a constant reminder of, our de of the devastation caused by hatred of the other, but also as a constant rem reminder than what it is through love of our fellow human being and through the love of a stranger in our gates that we actually fulfill the instructions in our holy book in the Torah. Good evening all. Welcome to this evening's program, to this evening's event, which basically is to commemorate and to remember the Holocaust and how it affected our lives and it has various messages for us at different levels. One is to remember the people who we lost and it was a, a universal tragedy. It wasn't just six million Jews, it was so many millions of others who perished as a result of the Holocaust or during the Holocaust. Not to forget the hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers who fought in that battle and too lost their lives. It was an event which affected the whole wide world. And as we come today to commemorate, it's not just to commemorate, it's to mark the event and to, to take lessons of what happened in history. Now, the first lesson we tend to do is we must not forget. Fine, that's one basic thing. However, what's the next stage? The next stage is we say we must never allow it to ever again happen, such a thing. Never again, that's the message. But what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do? so that it should never happen again. That should really be the focus and, and the uh, which, um, point in which we should concentrate. What can we do? Well, let me start with a bit of an introduction. All humankind are created in the image of God. Forget about our race, forget about our color, forget about our religion. We are all created equally in the image of God. The first man was Adam, and from there we all came. So what does that mean? It means, in effect, that two people who really come from the same source are, have the same look, so to speak. Or that's another thing about the greatness of God himself, of course, is that no, no two people look alike. We all do, even identical twins, there are differences because God, in his wisdom and ability, was able to create so much, all of us different that we could recognize ourselves. However, the fact is we are created in the image of God. How can it possibly be? that one person in that image can decide it's the correct thing to kill somebody else who comes from the same source. It's something, it's unfathomable. It's something which we cannot understand, what I don't understand anyway. How does it happen? So therefore, when we say never again, we have to realize as follows, that we've got to do something. Now, as, an, as an, an individual, my, so this is my personal opinion, I'm, I'm sure others may agree with me too, and that is that Ofsted do a wonderful job of inspection of schools, but they concentrate on the curriculum, they concentrate how well the children do, the progress they make, the standards they achieve, and as life goes on, they get more experience, more knowledge, and they get equipped for life. For, for life. But to my mind, there is not enough on that curriculum for every single school that we should teach about and there's three things, three things need to be taught. Number one is education, number two is education, and number three is education. It's the education of morality, ethics, 
behavior, how to get on with one another. I feel that there should be much more stress than that. And that's the only thing really that can persuade somebody who's created in my image that I have an equal right to exist and each and any one must think and take care and reach out with love to other people in that same image and from the same source, regardless of, as I say, of our backgrounds. And I think that's what, the, that's what must be the answer to all this. Well to remember, well not to forget, but we must do things positively. And that is education, not merely taking people to, to Auschwitz or to other, to other of these camps, or the, the extermination camps, but rather to explain to people. And on that basis, let me once again mention, which I did mention again last year, and that is that we then had the flood according to the Bible, which we believe in. Then came the era of Noah, and Noah was given seven basic laws by God for him and mankind. And that applies to us all. Number one is to believe in God. Number two is not to blaspheme our Creator. Number three is not to create any murder, for reasons I've explained anyway. Number two, no, next one, sorry, is not to, uh, to tear apart an animal. To, cruelty to animals is basic to our existence as well. Number five, not to steal. Number six, in our intimate relationships that we have, there should be no immorality in that area. And finally, and this is so important, to establish courts of law. Courts of law to administer, I say, judgment. I hate it when people say to administer justice because there are so many, unfortunately, there are so many different crimes. And I don't believe that necessarily the same justice is achieved if the same punishment is meted out for, uh, for absolutely everything. We need to have courts, laws of, courts of law that administer judgment. And if we have that, then the world becomes a better place. And God created the world and put us on it, all human beings, to improve the world. Not that he needed us to do that, not that he, <coughs> he couldn't do the job himself, but the purpose of creation was that each and every one of us should contribute to the world. We started off with a caveman, we saw, and then we discovered a wheel, and today it's space and it's computers. That is what God wanted as time goes on and people have got more experience. And we work on the knowledge of the past generations. We improve the world, but we improve it for everybody. And that's what, let me sort of end that little bit of what I have to say in, in, in that we must concentrate on this idea of education, how important it is, but we should feature and focus on the matters, not only on knowledge, but also on human behavior to create a better world that we can live in that way and understand that we are all in the image of God. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. This is the one day each year on which we dedicate time to remembering the Holocaust and all the genocides that have taken place since. We take time to learn about the victims and the brave people who stood against their persecution. Primo Levi, an Italian Jewish chemist, was one victim of the Holocaust. He wrote with frightening honesty about his experience in Auschwitz. He said, monsters exist, but they're too few in numbers to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the common men, the functionaries ready to believe and act without asking questions. What Holocaust Memorial Day does is to make sure that we common men do not find, follow mindlessly, that we do question and that we reject the call of monsters to follow them. And it does even more than that. My friend and neighbour Edith survived the Holocaust. Her family fled Austria in 1938 when she was a small child and she now speaks to children in schools about her experiences, especially her memories of being a refugee in a strange country, knowing no one but her family, missing familiar faces, sights and sounds and unable to understand the language. By sharing like this, she helps our children to understand how confused and anxious the young refugees joining their classes feel and how to make them feel welcome. Holocaust Memorial Day may be only one day, but it's a powerful force for good. What we learn may and often does make us cry, but those tears don't blind us. They wash our eyes and clear our vision so that we can build a better world. Thank you. Abraham Brisch was born in Kletchow, Poland, and grew up in Lunchitz, a town about a day's travel on foot from Łódź. About 30 to 40% of the town at the time were Jews of varying observance, 
with a great synagogue where his father was the cantor. The Germans captured the town in 1939 and the inhabitants suffered public oppression, humiliation and sickness. By 1942, the remaining Jewish residents, close to 2,000 people, were sent to Chelno, the first death camp devised by the Nazis. No one survived that trip. Abraham lost his parents, his brothers, his sisters, and many other close family members, and never got the chance to even bury them. Being of working age, 22 at the time, he was kept alive and put into forced labour camp. He spent the following years being moved from one camp to another, and in the latter part of the war, he ended up in Auschwitz. He survived the war and eventually ended up in England. A few years later, he married Issa Stern, herself a survivor in her own right. Abraham and Issa have three children, 18 grandchildren, and about 25 great-grandchildren to date. While Abraham Brish is no longer with us, I know that he would feel proud that I, one of his beloved grandchildren, am here today commemorating Holocaust Memorial Day. To put it simply, if he would not have experienced miracle after miracle and survived the horrors of the Holocaust, if he would have succumbed to the same fate as the rest of his family, I and 45 other souls would not be here today. Six million is a huge number. It's unfathomable. There's no way to meaningfully remember six million people. It becomes a statistic. It becomes a meaningless label called the Holocaust. And the same is true for all genocides. They're just a number. We find it very difficult to attach ourselves emotionally to the horrors that these people experienced. And yet each one of those victims had their own unique story, their own unique experience, their own life, their own family. We must remember that so that we don't get caught up in statistics. The famous Holocaust memorial in Jerusalem is called Yad Vashem. This is drawn from the verse in Isaiah, I will give them a Yad Vashem, a hand and a name. It's difficult to bear and understand and empathise with millions of deaths. But one name, that we can relate to. The theme of Holocaust Memorial Day this year is one day. This acknowledges that if we really want to learn the lessons of the Holocaust, of Cambodia, of Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur and other genocides, we must strive to learn about the experiences of one family on one day and try to put ourselves in their shoes. Today, I ask you not to remember the Holocaust, not to remember a genocide of six million people. I'm asking you to remember the innocence, the suffering, the plight and the murder of just one soul. And then, only then, multiply that six million times. Each of those souls could have been a dynasty today, but they were never given the chance. We have the chance today to remember and build a world culture that ensures that these atrocities, atrocities like these, never happen again. The Second World War was coming to an end, and the Nazis were facing almost certain defeat. In an effort to conceal the atrocities that had happened during the Holocaust, they ordered the evacuation of Auschwitz. In freezing conditions, nearly 60,000 Auschwitz prisoners were forced to walk in what would later be called 
a death march. 25-year-old Zofia Stepien Bator was one of them. A white road and the large black walls of the forest on both sides. We could hear the squeaking of the snow and the laboured breathing of the tired prisoners. Gunshots kept ripping the nighttime silence apart. And women were constantly thudding into the ditch for their eternal repose. Then someone ahead of me fell over. I helped her up. She was a tiny girl. Totally exhausted and as completely alone as I was. Every few steps, she stumbled. She had a huge backpack on her back. Get rid of that. It will be lighter, I urged her. No, I've got bread in there. If I get rid of it, I'll starve to death. She was breathing heavily and whimpering like a baby. I threw her bundle to the ground. She wept out loud. Don't cry. I've got bread. I'll walk with you and I'll share it with you. You haven't got the strength to carry anything. I learned walking along beside her and supporting her that she didn't have anyone at all in the world. She was a Jewish girl from the vicinity of Radom. Her parents had been killed. And she didn't have anyone or anywhere to return to. She used up a good deal of energy in her lamentation. In the end, I forbade her to talk or moan. I declared that she would come back with me to my home. And I wouldn't leave her. I begged her to gather up her strength, to hold out until dawn, because the sun would come up in the morning and that would make things easier. She calmed down and went on for a while with a regular gait. And then she fell again. I picked her up. Now I was dragging her along. Nobody helped me. Prisoners barely able to stay on their feet were passing us by. And I, I had lost so much strength. I was all sweaty from the effort, but I was past the point where I could have left her. And so we found ourselves at the tail end of the column. When she fell for the final time and I no longer had the strength to lift her up, I called for help and somebody's hand took hold of me and pulled me forward. I was very tired and did not realise I was not going to save that girl and that I myself could die with her. One of the prisoners, a stranger, oriented himself to the situation, grabbing me up by the arm and pulled me along with her. A moment later, there was a shot. It was my poor little ward, whom I had promised not to abandon, and she had stopped suffering. The echo of that shot still rings in my memory. Over 50 years later, seven-year-old Yasmin Yusuf Yusufovic was also forced to walk. This time to escape soldiers approaching his home in Srebrenica. On the morning of that July 11th, the shooting started early, closer than ever before. It was a hot day outside. Mom and Babo were packing up our stuff in cloth shopping bags. I jumped and packed my school bag with the little prince and the encyclopedia. The shelling continued all morning. More and more people started moving out of the town. Running, we were foolishly waiting for something. Then someone from the crowd yelled, the Chechniks have come down to the marketplace. We grabbed our bags. My father grabbed me as he would a bag, and we fled from the hill on which our house was located to join the crowd of people fleeing. Behind us, we could hear bursts shooting. While running down the street, I tore my right sleeve on a fence. The same fence which was blown apart by a grenade that also killed children playing a football tournament in front of our school. I may have cut my arm as well, but I didn't feel it at the time. Mother took the backpack off my back, shook out my books and looked at me. I just shrugged. That's how my little prince book got left behind. She consoled me by saying they would have been too heavy on my back while we were fleeing. I was thinking to myself, 
Maybe they wouldn't have been too heavy, but I kept silent. Nothing seemed to make sense anymore. Yasmin and his parents kept moving, hiding out in an old factory to escape the violence. Eventually, soldiers arrived and forced those inside onto buses and trucks. Father was pushing mother and me in front of himself. Mother was holding me tight against her, wrapping me in her clothes. It was hard to run like that. We were passing one, then another, truck and bus, all until someone shouted, get in! And I found myself in front of a wooden ladder which was leaned onto the truck. I thought the sooner I climbed up the ladder, the sooner all three of us would be on the truck and all of this would come to an end. Halfway up the ladder, I heard an order shouted behind me. You, get down, over there. And I heard a commotion. I climbed up the few remaining steps and turned around. Mother was sitting in front of the ladder, waving her hands. And down the road, a soldier was pushing my father with a rifle. I couldn't see anything else besides the three of us and that soldier. I went stiff. Father was being forced by the soldier into a ditch by the road, while another was yelling at mother to make her climb up. Mother grabbed me, completely petrified, and carried me deeper into the truck. I was still looking towards father. He was standing in the ditch. He turned around towards us to see us out. When he saw I was looking at him, he put his finger over his mouth as if to tell me, shh. And waved his hand as if to say, go. I didn't hear. Maybe we were shouting, but I didn't hear. I remember that I couldn't move a thing. I left my eyes on my father. I only know I clenched my teeth hard and inside I wanted to explode. It made tears come to my eyes that fogged up my view of my father. I only managed to raise my hand up a little bit and in my mind I thought I was waving to him. He only repeated that motion of his shush, go. He didn't have his usual beret on his head. I thought that maybe he would be hot out in the sun. He was wearing a t-shirt on him, cream coloured. With wide azure stripes, a worn out leather vest, black pants and worn out shoes, the only ones he had in Trebonitsa. Under his arm, he was carrying my red hooded jacket. And so he stayed watching us, shh, go. It was as if someone had taken me, carried me out of the truck and into the heavens. I saw that in the ditch around my father were many more men. That was the last time Yasmin saw his father. He was one of around 8,000 men and boys murdered in Srebrenica. Their bodies bulldozed into mass graves. When Khmer Rouge forces seized Phnom Penh in 1975, Puk Yung Lee and his wife were living in a town with eight of their children. Residents cheered the Khmer Rouge soldiers when they arrived, relieved to see the end of a civil war that had lasted for eight years. However, the celebrations were short-lived. The entire town was ordered to leave as the Khmer Rouge forced millions of Cambodians to work as manual laborers in the countryside. Puk Yun Lee kept a secret diary, writing that he and his wife had been forced to march for nearly two weeks. Our family reached the village around 9am on May the 1st, 1975. As we slept at night at that village, your mother and I heard lots of rumours about how people were brought to be killed in groups. Your mother and I were very concerned about our safety. We intended to travel further but we were worried that we would be killed. Our family moved into a wooden house with a brick shingle roof with six other evacuee families. Together we were a total of 40 people. It was very crowded and because of our living conditions, there was a complete lack of basic hygiene. We lived there for three months before Khmer Rouge Authority moved our family to a 
separate place of our own. The diary was kept hidden in a clay vase. Under the Khmer Rouge, it was illegal to own private property. Anyone deemed to be educated was considered a threat to the regime and imprisoned or executed. In 1976, Pok Yun Lee was arrested and later died in prison. But his diary survives as one of only four known first-hand accounts penned by victims and survivors of the Khmer Rouge. Despite thousands of prisoners being forced to evacuate Auschwitz in the death march, when Soviet troops reached the camp, they found it was not empty. Around 9,000 prisoners were discovered, most of them too ill to leave the camp. Alexander Vorontsov was a camera operator in the Soviet military who recorded the liberation. A ghastly sight arose before our eyes. A vast number of barracks. People lay in bunks inside many of them. There were skeleton clad in skin with vacant gaities. Of course, we spoke with them. However, these were brief conversations because these people who remained alive were totally devoid of strength. And it was hard for them to say much about their time in the camp. They were suffering from starvation and they were exhausted and sick. When we talked with these people and explained to them who we were and why we had come here, they trust us a bit more. The women wept and this cannot be concealed. The men wept as well. You could say that there were pyramids on the grounds of the camp. Some were made up of accumulated clothing, others of pots and still others of human jaws. I believe that not even the commander of our army had any idea of the dimension of the crime committed in these large of camps. The memories has stayed with me for all my life long. All of this was the most moving and most terrible things that I saw and filmed me during the war. Time has no sway over these recollections. It has not squeezed all the horrible things I saw and filmed out of my mind. As the Rwandan president's aircraft prepared to land, surface-to-air missiles shot it down, killing everyone on board. The assassination was the trigger for the Rwandan genocide. In just a hundred days, 800,000 people were murdered. Jean-Louis Mazimpaka was 17 years old at the time and studying to be a nurse. When the president was killed, we thought that we might be some trouble in the capital, but we have no idea of the scale of what followed. My family is Tutsi, but there was no Tutsi land on who to land. People had mixed marriage. We went to the same school, live in the same village, share a language. We hear on the radio that Tutsi were being attacked and that roadblocks were being erected. But we weren't worried for ourselves. We didn't think it would reach where we lived. We were wrong. The killing in my town didn't start until a week after the president was killed. But on the 15th of April, a friend, the husband of the teacher, was killed. People with machete came to steal from his house and they killed him. Still we thought we were safe and that this was one off. But the next day in the neighboring town, another teacher and his family were killed and we started to get worried. A friend warned me our family was next. He was part of the militia, but I used to give him medicine from free and we played football together. We took his warning seriously and that night we stayed with, with a Utsu friend 
who had a Tutsi wife. When we went to look our house the next morning, there was nothing left. Everything had been stolen. We went to the church, refugees started arriving to mostly Tutsi, but some Utsu. Some had machete wounds. They were crying, hungry, desperate and confused. There have been violence in 1959 and 1973. The churches had been sanctuary then, so people thought they've been safe. Some of us suggested escaping in the boats over Lake of Kivu to Democratic Republic of Congo. But the older people, including my parents, still believe it will be okay. That will won't be attacking the church. On the 18th of April, the militia arrived and we saw them preparing attack. By then, it wasn't just the militia, it was the rest of the population as well, including the friends who had warned us. Everybody have been brainwashed by the militia to join in. Holocaust Memorial Day is a day to remember those who died in the Holocaust, as well as the genocides that have taken place since. Genocide is still happening today. Since 2003, hundreds of thousands of civilians have been killed in the Darfur civil war. Millions more have been displaced. Hawa Mohammed and her family lived in Darfur when they were attacked. Many of them were killed. Despite being shot and physically abused, Hawa survived and managed to help her children escape. They have now built a new life in America. I often doubted that I would survive to see another day, but something deep in my heart was telling me that I would. I decided not to surrender. Even when I felt exhaustion, thirst and hunger, or when I was overwhelmed by sadness, thinking of the genocide perpetrator's intent to humiliate and exterminate us. In Houston, Texas, we found a new home and a new life with loving people. I was told that my body had been severely injured by the shooting and that I would never be able to work. It was hard to believe, but I didn't let that shake my confidence. I was determined to be productive and optimistic, no matter what. Now that I was living safely in the United States, I wanted to go to school, get a degree and be a fluent English speaker. I had never been able to go to school in Sudan because it was not considered safe for girls to go to school, only boys. I am happy to say that in the last four years, I finished an ESL course successfully, did an ACT test, and I'm currently working on my GED to be able to go to college. I'm doing great in my classes and remain a distinguished student in spite of my multiple responsibilities and health situation. My children are in college and working evening jobs to support our family. They also play sports and are top ranking students in their schools. I have also been able to give birth to two more healthy children. My plan for the future is to continue to speak up for myself and other women, to fight against genocide, write a book, and to study law to be able to pursue justice for me and my people. Thank you all for watching our broadcast. I hope you all enjoyed the life stories. The life stories you heard, these stories reiterate the importance and the experiences faced by families, the stories of their one day. 
Tonight we shared with you Holocaust Memorial Day that it's not only about remembering past genocide and honoring those who died, but also it's an opportunity for us all to learn lessons from the past through the stories of those who survived the Holocaust Memorial Day. And it helps us to provide an insight into how our communities can support those escaping persecution today and looking to build new homes within our communities. And so I hope that we will all reflect on all that we've seen tonight in solemn appreciation of the comfort and safety of today, our present one day. Thank you very much.